Father, thank you for your word. And whatever you want us to see and experience, God, that's what we want to see and experience today. Whatever you want us to learn and grow from, that's what we want. God, if there's any here that don't know you, may today's word being poured over them awaken their spirit to salvation. And if there's any here that are in dire straits, God, that are in need, God, may us not be playing church in this place for those hearts that are here that are troubled because their relationship is breaking down. Their kids are going crazy. Their job's coming to an end. Mentally, they are depressed. God, we lift up those people to you now. And by the power of your precious word, may the realization that you are greater than this world come upon them now. We ask it in the name of our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you've been here for the last few weeks, we've established some facts, and I want to go over them to you. Through chapters 2 and 3 and 4 of 2 Corinthians, we established facts, and I wrote these facts down. The first fact we learned, life sucks. You're hard-pressed on every side. You're pushed down. You're crushed. We learned life sucks. And we learned... That being a Christian, don't stop life from being sucky sometimes. Matter of fact, being a Christian is like putting a bullseye on your chest. And life, big old punch sometimes right in the chest. Especially when you want to be a Christian at work or at home. or Man, you just want to live the life. The second thing we learned... God is greater than life. God is greater than life. You know that? We learned that. Now, if you don't believe that, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know how I can make it any clearer. Remember, if you remember last week, I asked you, what do you believe in? Do you believe in what your husband says? Do you believe in what the TV says? Do you believe the newspaper? Do you believe the internet? What do you believe? And I established a fact with you that God had brought my life to a place of total surrender. And I had one belief now. One. I trust one thing. This book. I trust it now. I've come to the end of everything that I thought was true and real and right. I, I came to the, the end of everything I believed in. Mom and dad and wife and kids. Nothing satisfies. Nothing was true. Nothing was real. I've come to the fact life sucks, but God is greater than life. And I held on to this book. I remember the first time coming to the conclusion that I didn't want to be a Republican, and I didn't want to have uh, any kind of political value. I, I wanted one thing. I wanted to be a Christian. I wanted this book to be my guideline, my plumb line, my guidepost. And I realized God was greater than life. What a joy. I also from God's scripture, showed you something last week. Life is temporary. You're not here forever. This house is not a house, it's a tent, but you, Christian, have a superstructure. You have a building whose structure was not made with hands. Life sucks. God is greater than life. Life is temporary. We, spiritually, are eternal. We go on forever. Some go on to eternal life. Some go on to eternal death, separation from God. Facts we established the last few weeks. I wrote them down. These are the facts we established. You said life is temporary, Ryan. Now you're saying we're eternal. Oh, that's right. And how glorious it is to know that we go on even after this thing is gone. And you know what number five was? God's got this. 
God's got this, man. God has got this. We were encouraged last week to find out God's got this, man. In our victories, God's got it. In our defeat, God's got it. When we're happy, God's got it. When we're sad, God's got it. God's got this, man. We learned that. Therefore, or wherefore, chapter 5, verse 9 says, We labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Give me your attention, please. He says, given the facts that we just shared with you, knowing that life is temporary but you go on, Knowing that life stinks, but God's greater than life. Knowing all those facts that we've established in the first four chapters of the book of Hebrews, you need to count yourself working for a great master who is pleased with you, but wants you to do more with him. You see that? Whether we labor, I mean, therefore we labor that whether we're with him or not, we may be accepted of him, where we live or we die. And here he established what's called, you guys ready? The Bema Seat Judgment. There's two judgments according to Scripture in the book of Revelation. One is called the Great White Throne Judgment. The other one's called the Bema Seat Judgment. That word for Bema Seat, let me explain to you. That's a Greek word, Bema. And in the Olympics, back in Roman times, they would have the Bema Seat where all those that competed in the old Roman time Olympics, they would sit on the beam of seat and they would get their reward. You competed well. You competed well. You competed well. You came in first. You came in second. You came in third. That's where that word comes from, the beam of seat. The great white throne judgment, though, that's where those who do not believe in Christ will be sent to eternal damnation. And the movie of their life will play. Hey, let's take a look at your life. Hey! There's where you had the chance to accept Christ as your Savior, but didn't. There's where you had the second chance. And back and forth and back and forth. There's where you cursed God. Congratulations. There's where somebody told you that wasn't a wise thing to do. There's where... Some... And after all is said and done, the Bible says that every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, everybody will be without excuse. Because I don't know about you, but I got great excuses for everything I do wrong. Ask my wife. Why'd you come home so late, Ryan? Were you talking to somebody? I'm thinking. Hold on. No, I wasn't. I was working. Working. I was, I was sharing my faith with somebody. You have kids and a wife home. You want to come home right after work? Tomorrow. Sure. Have excuses, though. Bible says nobody is going to have an excuse. When they show your life on the screens... At the great white throne judgment, all you're going to do is this. And then according to the second chapter of the book of Proverbs, you're going to cry out for him, can I have mercy? And he's going to say to you, no, sorry, you had your chance. It's over now. Oh, no, 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 but you see, I was going to live my whole life, and then when it was, I was dying on my bed, then I'd receive him as my Savior. Did you really think that was going to work against God? Kind of hoped it would. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. That's what he's going to say. But that's the great white throne judgment. Here, it's the Bema Seat judgment. Let me explain to you what the Bema Seat judgment is for. For you that serve here in the cleanup ministry, he's going to go, you know, you came here and you washed the chairs. You came here and you served at the sound booth. You came here and you sang in the band and you did it because you loved God. Here is, here is your crown or your reward or your jewel and he places it on your head. You mean you're going to get rewarded for what you've done for God. You're going to get rewarded according to scripture for what you did with the right motives. Now, everybody's going to go to heaven, although the Bible says some going to heaven like they're on fire. Woo! Woo! -hoo! Woo! <laughs> some, though, who did right and just loved God, 
they're going to get these crowns and he's going to put them on your head. Now the Bible also says that the first thing you're going to do is take the crown off and throw it at his feet and go, I had nothing to do with it. You can't do it to me. No, no, no. This is yours. And look how you get to spend eternity. Giving you the facts. Giving you the facts. Now, go ahead. Continue. Verse 10 again. For we must all appear before the judgment, the bema seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So we know that life's eternal. We know we're going to appear before him. We know that all the things that we do are going to set, get set before. And the Bible says they're going to be put in a fire. And some of them are made of straw. They're going to get burnt up. Some of them are made of hay. Some of them are going to get wood. But the things that are golden, they stay. And then he gives them back to you. Verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. He says, knowing the terror of of the Lord. The terror of the Lord. Nobody talks about the terror of the Lord these days. Hey, remember when I talked about the great white throne judgment? Guess what, guys? It happens. You know what happens every day? People die and go to hell every single day. People are dying and going to hell. Here, the Lord is saying through the Apostle Paul, my brothers and sisters, since all these things be true, you have a task and you want to be found busy about that task. And it doesn't matter how much money you made, how many houses you bought, it doesn't matter. There is something that matters that will be put in the fire and not be burnt up. And you know what that is? Here, verse 12, for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory in our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. Please give me your attention. Here's what he says. Let me paraphrase Paul, who speaks in really weird ways sometimes. He says, I want you to do what's right, so I'm going to come up here and tell you what to do, even if... It's a waste of my time. I'm doing it with right motives and a right heart. Hey guys, there's a lot more important things I could be doing to my life than sitting up here and preaching God's word. In case you didn't know, I don't get a weekly paycheck. I have a beautiful wife and incredible kids. I love training jujitsu. I can just as soon now put the Bible down and go, bye, I'm going to the gym, ask my wife. I can leave now and not come back for five hours. I'll do jujitsu, more Thai. I'll, I'll train the rest of the day. See you tonight, baby. But I have reckoned in my life there is more important than me. I have reckoned in my life that there is even more important than my wife. I have reckoned in my life that serving Christ where I am is more important. Amen. Do you understand that? Here Paul is saying, I'm here preaching this message to you. Why do you think? Don't you think there's more important things for me to do? Because I want you to do what's right with the right heart, the right motive. I am taking myself and putting it in your conscience. Because the, let me tell you something. There's some people sitting here right now that are going, dude, why don't you just run your church and let me be? I came here preaching. Some people are rejecting God's instructions. They're going, I have more important things to do. Turn it off, pal. Verse 13, for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. He says, whatever we do, whether things are good, I'm preaching this message. Whether things are bad, I'm preaching this message. I want you, listen, like a good father does, he wants the best things for his kid. So I teach my son how to serve Christ. I teach my daughters how to serve Christ. So blessed and honored I am that all of my children serve God. Why? So you can look at my kids and go, wow, what a great guy Ryan is? No. So that they would have treasures in heaven so that they would have heaven itself. And I can go, wow. I can rest now. Let me tell you. Let me explain the physical aspect of that. Parents that are here. Let me explain to you what that's like. Okay, I sat exactly where Peter is sitting. And I watched my 21, I think you were 21 at the time. 
year old daughter get married. 21 years I protected that child's body. 21 years I protected that child's heart. And when she went up there and I walked down the aisle with her hand and I gave her to her husband. Like she's yours now, buddy. I sat over there and the pastor that was doing this ceremony he said, you may now kiss your bride. I made it. What a sense of accomplishment. What a sigh of relief. Now I only got four more. <laughs> but that's the way it is. My daughter is serving God. My daughter is serving God. My son is serving God. Woof. Cammy and Kenny, oh, they're going to be tough. <laughs> this is what Paul's talking about. I'm doing this for you. I get nothing out of this. It's not like I'm doing this, and while I'm doing this, I'm going, God, you watch me? Do I get an extra jewel in my crown or something? When I get there for preaching the word, I'm going to get more, right? No. Like a good father, he just wants to see his children prosper, succeed, go forward. Continuing. This is interesting. Here's where we explain things a little deeper about what we're talking about. Verse um, 14, thank you. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we judge this. Ready? That if one died for all, then all are dead. Hold your place there. Please turn. Now I know it's worded a little different in some of the, your Bibles. I'm giving you the literal translation. Let me explain to you what he means. Please keep your place there because we're going to come back. Turn to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis in chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Let me show you what he means here. What exactly Paul is talking about. Picture, let me set it up for you. God the Father is in heaven. He is enjoying the presence, the oneness, the unity of somehow inexplicable. The Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father are all dwelling in one perfect unity. And he says, let's make something wonderful. Let's make something that we can place all our delight in. So he creates man. Perfection. Do you realize that you are created perfect, that the, the lie that is evolution, you are perfect. They could not create a better human. They could not create anything better. Two hands and two feet, a heart that pumps, the brain, the way it acts, and every weakness that you have of your flesh, your brain will cover. You are the top of the food chain, baby. And even more important than that, you created a spirit, a soul, and a body in co perfect communicado with God. You didn't even have to pray. God was there. No need for even prayer. I set, th I set that up right? Watch what happens. Verse 1 of chapter 3 of the book of Genesis. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall they touch it, lest ye die. Please, again, give me your attention. There is a tree right in the middle of the garden that he has placed his creation, his perfect creation. And he says, because of obedience, because that is the one thing that you lack, man, that you have to do on your own. Do you know that there's three things God can't do? Three things that God can't do. He can't lie. He can't make you love him. I don't remember the third one, but it's cool. One time I used to know all three. He can't deny himself. My daughter said that, of course. Love that kid. She's too good for you. He can't. 
God can't. Do you understand? So what happens is he can't take your free will. God cannot take you to heaven. I don't want to go. Fair enough. Bye. So he places in the midst of the garden the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For there is no need for you to know the difference between good and evil because you are in perfect communicado, perfect communion, perfect oneness with God. But the devil, disguising himself as a lizard, I say lizard because he still had legs, right? Couldn't be a snake. He says, hey, um... Did God really say you shouldn't eat of that tree? Doubt. Remember what I said to you? I came to the conclusion after the breaking of my life, after arrests and jails and prisons, and I had one thing to hold on to, this word. And now, every single time I have a struggle, it's the enemy going, does the Bible really say you can only have one wife? Uh, Jacob had four Come on. One. Yeah, it says one. Go away, devil. You guys got the point there, right? Verse four. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall surely not die. You're not going to die. Go ahead. Mangiare. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat the, the fruit thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam said, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. The Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called upon Adam and said unto him, What do you think he said to him? You think he had, Where are you? Where, where are you at? No. Let me tell you what he said. Where are you? As only the heart of a father who has lost his child. Where are you? Not where are you? Where are you? You think God didn't know? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee, thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman that, gavest, that thou gavest to be with me. I don't know why I'm having trouble reading the King James today, but... And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Now, you will hear from pastor to pastor to pastor, people tell you that Adam was blame shifting. Oh, it wasn't my fault, it was her fault. He was not. And there is no indication that he was. Let me tell you what he said. I love her more than I love you. And let me tell you something, men. There are men saying that today everywhere in the church. I can't do that. I can't say that. I can't do that. The woman that thou gavest to be with me gave to me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle. And above every beast of the field, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall be, ready? And it shall bruise thy head, and unto thou shalt bruise his heel. Give me your attention, let me explain exactly what happened. This is called the fall of man. We used to be a spirit a soul, your emotions, 
and a body. What happened is, at that point in time, bang, inverted. Now you are a body, a soul, and a spirit. Whereas you were connected fully with God, now in order for you to connect fully with God, you must get through the pleasures and desires of your flesh. You must go through this mind. God's not real. I don't see him. Well, where did everything come from? I don't know, but I don't think it was. you got to get through all this stuff. The fall of man. The title deed to the earth. The devil stole it right there from Adam. Mine now. And if you read the book of Revelation, first two, three chapters, you see who is worthy to open the seal? Who is worthy to take the deed back? There is but one. That was Jesus Christ, whom the Bible calls the second Adam. So let me explain to you again. Back, please, to 2 Corinthians. You that are studying such things and wondering what I'm talking about. Look what he says here. Very, very important why I went there. Verse 14 again. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Who's dead? Everybody who does not know Christ is born dead. Do you understand that? Dead. Oh, not that dude over there. He's really rich and he has a big house. God loves him, so he blessed him. Did he accept Christ as his Savior? No. Then he's dead! Well, at what point do you reckon them dead? Do they come out of the womb dead? They come out of the womb in sin. Now, the age of accountability from when a person has to choose Christ, that's, that's between God and God. <laughs> I have no idea about that. But I know that babies that die go straight to heaven because the Bible says that heaven's full of babies. Unless you actually become converted like a baby, you can't even get into heaven. He says that heaven's full of them. However, that's just to bring your mind back to a place we need to be. Every person is dead, guys. You know what that means? You're in this cesspool of death with one mission in mind. What is that mission? I'm glad you asked. Verse 15, And that he died for all. And I will be a wise guy and say, circle that word for all and right next to it, all! That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You who have been born again. What is the ultimate sign that you have been born again? That you don't live for yourself. And that you live to bring people to Christ. One of the ways you bring people to Christ is by inviting them to church. Well, they already go to church. Well, you go one week to them with their church and then they have them come here with you. I get that all the time. Well, my husband doesn't like going to church. What church does he want to go to? Pick it and go to that church. You'll find out. It's not this church he doesn't like. He doesn't like God. And when he comes here, he has to hear from God. Invite your friends. I don't care if you go to their church. I don't care if you invite them to another church because you're afraid of what your pastor might say. I don't care. This is your job. For again, he died for all that they which live, which are born again, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto them, unto him which died for them and rose again. Verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth, Know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, uh, hold on, let me, before I do 17, listen, here's what he says. I, this is one of those verses, you'll hear me say this as a pastor and joking, so please, this is one of the verses I hate. He says, from now on, you know no man after the flesh. You know what that means? You have no excuse. That means all those people that I really don't like, he says, you don't know them like that anymore. Now that you're born again, you look past what they've done to you and look past to where they're going. You have one goal. That person's going to hell, invite him to heaven. That person's going to hell, invite him to heaven. That person's going to hell. That's what you look now. Oh, not that person did me wrong in business, the hell with him. That guy did me wrong, the hell with him too. You don't have that chance anymore. You don't have that choice anymore. You don't have that opportunity anymore. 
Well, that dude, you don't know what he did to me. He broke my heart. Listen! From now on, you who live have one job, to bring those that are going to hell into heaven. You know, therefore, no man according to the flesh. No matter how they live their life, no matter what they've done wrong to you, it don't matter anymore. If they're going to hell, you can't say to hell with them. I hate that. I was really hoping some people were going to hell. You guys heard me say, it was Pastor John Cinelli that told me, you know you're a real Christian when you don't want your worst enemy to go to hell. Verse 17, probably the greatest verse in the entire Bible. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Please, give me your attention. Listen. Yes, and we've talked a lot about this the last couple of months. You must forgive those who've wronged you. The foundation of our belief. But here he's not talking about that just. He's saying the world was born dead. And in order to reconcile the world back to God, he employed, used, put forth, gave us his son that through his son, God was in Christ when he died on the cross, reconciling the world. There is a way. Hallelujah. There's a way. Because if anybody doesn't remember not being in Christ and the burden of their sin finally smacked them in the face and they went, I'm stuck. I will never, ever forget the first time I got arrested. I was in 10th grade. There was a security guard named Teddy. Everybody called him Big Teddy. And I punched him in the face. It's a long story. (laughs) He came and arrested me. And when you got arrested, where I was from, the first thing, it was a three-step process. The first thing they do is put you in handcuffs and smack you around a little bit. The second thing they do is they take you to what's called downtown. And I was, I was born in New York. I re- was raised in Queens. I went to the 106th district. I went down to 106. Where's he going? 106. I remember walking. They take you from one car to another car, and then you are. You walk in there, and then they hold you in a holding facility. And then from the holding facility, they take you downstairs after you get printed, and then you're in a waiting facility. Bars and with animals, criminals, disgusting creatures, just like me. And from there, you went to central booking. And while you were in central booking, you waited for the judge to call you, and you prayed it wasn't a Friday, because then you're there till Monday. That's funny, David. (laughs) Thanks a lot. But here's the thing. I remember the dread that fell upon me, hearing the stories of my friends who had been arrested, knowing my time was coming. I remember that dread that came over me, that... Because after all that, if you were in jail, you know what happens when you get out? It's like somebody took a boulder and put it on the top of your head. And you walk around with this giant boulder because you have to go to court. Well, first you have to find a lawyer. And if you didn't have money for a lawyer, then you had to get a public offender. And when you had a public offender, you know they were just going to be an offense to you. And then you had to go to court on the day they had you, but you knew it was going to get postponed. And then you went back three or four times over the course of the next year until the judge finally made a, registra- made a, made a judgment on your case, and then you got sentenced. And then when you, after you got sentenced, you either had to go pee in a cup every week or you had to go see it. It was like the beginning of the most miserable thing in the world that could happen. Being arrested, forget about the experience of being arrested, which is miserable in and of itself. Just what followed afterward, I'll never forget that feeling of dread, that feeling of woe, that feeling of dead. I'm stuck. But God, spiritually now, 
reaches into the cell before you've been put in handcuffs and he goes, wait, he's mine. And he pulls you out. And he pulls you out past the cop cars, past the 106th, past the holding facilities, past central booking, past the judge, past the public defenders. And he goes, no, 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 no. Mine. Man, was I looking for a savior. I prayed, and God's so faithful. Quick story, I know I'm... Mm. You guys want to hear the story? Yes. Yes. There was a guy who was running in a cab. Now, I say this to my shame, although there's some glory involved here. I just want you to know the mindset of the person. And I want, if it's all possible, anybody that's here that has or had or, or understands this mindset... I pulled a gun on a taxi driver because he threatened to beat up one of my friends. And I pushed him by his forehead back and told him to get back in his car or we would kill him. And he looked at, back at me and he said, I have witnesses. And I said, no, no, those are my friends. They're going to help me bury you. And he got back in his car and left. And we went into the pizzeria. It was in my neighborhood. And we had a, a pie. Well, as we're sitting there waiting, one of my buddies looks out and he says, bro, the cops are out there. And I was like, so I took the gun. And I gave it to my buddy. I said, go in the bathroom, wait, and I'll call you when, when they leave. Now, this female cop, she walks out, and she says, you, come here. And I was like, why? Just come here. Why? You know, total wise guy. Long story short, she arrests me, takes me downtown, and all the way to the police department, all the way to central booking, I'm like, how does it feel to arrest somebody you know did nothing wrong? How does it feel? How does it feel to know you're arresting somebody? How does it tell me? I just want to know, is there a conscience involved? Do you figure are, that badge gives you the ability to do anything you want? Ever the manipulator I was, ever the liar, ever the criminal, ever the sneak, ever the snake in the garden, Four o'clock in the morning, my cell opens. Gitman! Yeah, come on. Where am I going? It's four o'clock in the morning. Come on. And there's that female cop. And she says to me, go. I was like, why? She goes, you didn't do nothing. Just go. I was like, well, can I have a ride home? I'm about 12 miles from home. She's like, not a chance. And I'll never forget walking out of there going, free. No central booking. <laughs> no court. No public offender. No beating from my father for getting arrested again. I'll never forget that feeling. And that's spiritually now. That feeling. Out of jail. No more death. No more hell. Free. Even though the sentence of death is upon you. Even though that waits you, that court, that great white throne judgment, it awaits you. He goes, no, it's not for you. You got the best lawyer. He ain't a public offender. He is a just judge. And he ain't giving you what you deserve. So, in closing, stay with me. Last thought, I promise I'll be quick. Verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world. We talked about that now. Verse 20, here's where we finish. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray for you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God, for we have made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him? Briefly, three more minutes. You are an ambassador of Christ. Let me explain to you what he meant. This is fascinating. I read this this morning. In Roman times, Josiah, there was two kinds of provinces in greater Rome. You had the Roman Empire, and there was two provinces. You were either... Mm! You were either... Arlie, do you remember? I told Arlie this morning. One was an imperial or senatorial. Thank you. There was a senatorial province and an imperial province. The senatorial provinces were the ones who surrendered willingly. They said, you're the Roman Empire, we surrender to you, you lead us, you guide us. Spiritually speaking, that's the believers. We surrender. You're king, you're God. You're, you, listen, we know you can conquer us. We know you can conquer us. We are yours. 
but there was what's called the imperial province. The imperial province was a province that was conquered by Rome, but refused to go willingly. There was rebellions and the people hated Rome. So Rome, in an attempt to quell, to squash, to put at peace the imperial province, would send ambassadors. Isn't this fascinating? You, Christian, are an ambassador to the imperial province. The world's been defeated, guys. You can't beat God. God's already won. The victory's already won. In the last day, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Although they join forces, the wicked will not go unpunished, the Bible says. You are an ambassador. And here's what God sent you to do. Quell. To squash. Explain. Listen. You can't beat God. He loves you. He wants to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. You are an ambassador of Christ. And here he says this. Look at the last verse. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Because at that very same time that the title deed earth was ripped out of the hands of Adam and Eve, his death on the cross, he took it back. And now, and now, you can tell people that prison you're in, that jail you're in, listen, him who did nothing wrong, Christ who did not sin, is now going to take all your sin upon himself and he's going to take all of his righteousness and put it upon you. Woman that's had multiple abortions that thinks God could never love them. Man that's done something so atrocious in their life to some woman, some young woman who thinks God could never forgive them person who just lives their life and has no time, whatever place you are, whatever your choice is, whatever your drug of choice is, whatever your poison is, whatever sin it is, know this. I am an ambassador to an imperial province which is called the earth. And I'm telling you, you who are burdened and in prison, all you have to do is ask, and he gives you his righteousness. Oh. Behold, he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. We... Um, Oh, I want to sing a song of celebration. Would you please come up and sing a celebratory song? Maybe that one song that we've been singing every other week. Father, thank you so much that you who knew no sin have become sin, that we who knew so much sin, have, how we can now become the righteousness of God. Thank you, God, that although you didn't owe a dime, I had a debt I couldn't pay, so you paid a debt that you didn't know. Thank you so much, God. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. Bless. If there's anybody here, God, any one person that is here, hey, give me your attention, please. If you're here and you don't know the things that I'm speaking of, it is possible that you don't know Christ. If you don't know that joy that I spoke of, of being pulled out of the prison, past those gates, past the, 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 the judges and the lawyer, if you don't know that, let me tell you, in the privacy of your own place, you just say, God, save me. When Peter was sinking, he didn't have to say, uh, God, um, I'm walking on the water and I'm too heavy and there I'm sinking and, and, and now I'm going to drown. Water's going to fill up my lungs and get my eyes in the... He didn't say any of that. You know what he said? What did he say? That's all you got to say and you're going to heaven. That's all it takes. Let's sing a song of celebration. Yes.
Underground is sinking sand.